What is really unique about the geology of Louisa County is that the crop production and a high productivity soil and all of that is directly correlated to what happened back in the geologic past. And it's all because of uh, the continental glaciation came down through here and it created a great glacial lake called Lake Calvin. That was the process that created a sandy environment to the north of Columbus Junction and it created all the outwash from the glaciers when it melted, created a rich, dark, black organic soil to the south part of Louisa County. And since then, the Iowa and the Cedar River have begun to flow down through their channels and they come together here north of Columbus Junction and proceed to the south. And again, they, like any other rivers, they bring all kinds of material from the north that's good soil from the north, ground up rock, and all this organic material and minerals that we use in the southern part of Louisa County to produce corn, soybeans, and a lot of tremendous crops. Pretty sure the first folks showed up in Louisa County about 8,000 years ago because that's when they're first finding projectile points and worked stuff that they can actually date the stuff around in the campsites. But the big boost of population came about 2,000 years ago, around 300 AD to 300 BC. That was when the Hopewell culture kind of popped up around the Toolsboro area. There were more villages, there was trade routes going on in the area. There's a unique type of church that occurs out on Long Creek, and it was quite frequently used by the Indians in their and making the manufacturing of arrowheads. The Indian culture was quite prominent in Eliza County, and one of the reasons they were here because there were a lot of springs for water, a lot of uh, wildlife for them, a lot of game for them, and also the abundance of chert. My granddad was big on nature. He taught me how to find Indian chewing tobacco, how to find where the little baby foxes were at. We'd lay on the ground and watch baby foxes play in the sun and do stuff like that. We do know that the Columbus Junction is very close to an old council site that's to the north of Columbus Junction. Um, Frank Best tells a story about council meetings that were held in that area, and apparently the area south and east from Wapolo was an area designated as Chief Keokuk's hunting ground. And then Elport Junction down in southern Louisa County is right on the edge of where Black Hawk and Keokuk had their war council. I was just talking with some uh, engineers yesterday and I mentioned the fact that I was from Louisa County and, and they just kind of laughed because it's, you know, it's almost impossible to do anything in Louisa County because of all the, the historic sites, there are prehistoric sites and historic sites and uh, there's a reason for that, you know, and they're, they're going like, well, why is that, you know, and well, the reason for it is that the Iowa and the Cedar River come together in Louisa County and flow into the Mississippi River so you have this rich uh, resource of the river not only for diversity of food from what the early settlers could get on prairies but also uh, just as a, a waterway as a, as a transportation route. The people who lived here like a thousand or even two thousand years ago were always kind of mobile and they would try to pick an area they would concentrate on the trees because when you're underneath the trees you have the shady climate you have the firewood handy, you have the tree bark that you can peel off to cover your summer lodges, and in the fall, you can concentrate on the mast crop that's gonna come from like the hickories and the acorns and the hazelnuts. And during the summer, you might be going after the service berries and arona berries a little bit and understory things like the currants or the gooseberries the various cherries around too. But you are also concentrating on an area that has a lot of wildlife. So the wildlife are also utilizing those same trees that you were going for too. One of the things the pioneers noticed when they came here were the oak savannas that were really beautiful places where the prairie came in underneath the oak trees. People like to build their homes there and that's where village sites were a whole lot in the past too. To go out to California and Oregon uh, they didn't think prairies were places to settle because since they didn't have trees, the soil couldn't possibly be fertile. It wasn't until the invention of the moldboard plow that people realized that the prairies were indeed fertile and good places for agriculture. This is aronia berry. It will have a very dark blue berry when they're ripe. Up until a few years ago, almost nobody had ever heard of, and now it's the hottest thing in agriculture. Scientists have found they're really high in antioxidants. It's a very healthy fruit to eat, 
And people have gotten so excited about arona berries that in fact Europeans have planted huge quantities of these bushes in Europe. These are hazelnut clusters. These are brown. When they first come off the bush, they would be green, same color as the leaf, which helps them camouflage. And one of the ways you can tell if your nut is ripe is if it will turn or spin easily in the cluster like that. And it will come out very nicely. So there's your nice little hazelnut. My great-great-grandfather, Edmondson, came here in the 1800s and came to this country to raise horses for the market. So I was born up where the sand pit is, north of Fredonia. And then in 1927, we moved to uh, Bay Island, just north of New Boston, Illinois. We had one landlord that had five farms, and that another place had a section. We had the section and the five farms, and we farmed it all with horses. There was no automobiles at that time. My brother started racing colts, and he said, didn't think he had money to buy colts, but Dad said he'd put up the money if he'd train them. So he started to train them. First two they got was good ones, <laughs> they didn't want to sell them. I grew up uh, born and raised in Wapala, moved to Columbus Junction after college, and so my flying has basically been starting from here and going elsewhere. A group of uh, about nine of us owned an airplane that was called the Loiza Flying Club, and that was in use for many years. First of all, I like to fly in the spring because everything is green, and I, and I really like Iowa in April. And you can see all the different textures of the fields, but I like to fly uh, over the rivers, uh, especially east of Columbus Junction here, uh, the Iowa and Cedar Rivers meet. And uh, always a neat thing I show people when I fly is the, is the different colors of the two rivers. The, uh, the Iowa River is uh, kind of a muddy color and the Cedar River is probably more clear because it has a sandy bottom and you can just see that line going down. So that's always kind of phenomenal to see. Some of the best limestone in the state of Iowa is mine in Louisa County. Growing up on a farm five miles south of town, my granddad's farm, we had the Louisa County limestone quarry was on our farm. That's how I kind of got interested in geology and the things I do now. Many parts of what we now consider Lake Odessa were actually farm fields. The lock and dam as it came along and was proposed was going to make the area too wet, was going to adversely impact the farming operations. So those people were bought out by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to support the nine-foot navigation channel. In turn, what happened was the Corps at that time, they didn't manage land. And so it was ground that was lent itself well to wildlife management, but nobody to manage it. And that's how the original agreement was developed to turn it over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I was born uh, in, actually in Muscatine. Before the age of five, moved to the family farm area where the Loisa Generating Station currently is located and also Monsanto was a part of the, the original farmstead for the Beatties. That was my grandmother's family. The Beatty family farm was pretty poor because of the, it was part of the Big Sand Mound. And the Big Sand Mound was very high and dry, if you will, uh, sitting some 20 or 30 feet above the rest of the elevation uh, of the surrounding uh, Muscatine Island. We didn't farm that area. It wasn't farmable. So basically, I just hunted there and then would uh, it was, since it was adjacent to the river, I would go there and fish, and, but I was on my own pretty much the whole time I was there. My, I had a brother who was two years younger than I, and he didn't really hunt and fish as much as I did, so it was kind of like my whole world back there. I started hunting when I was about nine years old, and we used to come to Lake Odessa, and I can remember going down the Sand Run Hill back then, there wasn't even gravel. I can remember the one time because it was in 1939 because my father had just bought a new Chevrolet. He got down at the bottom of the hill and it started raining after we'd been out hunting and the only way we could get up over the hill we had to put on chains. When I become a teenager, you know, you always kind of wanted to hunt on your own and my dad and my uncle would be hunting out on the main blind. And I'd way back into the potholes in the back and try and shoot my own ducks. And so I'd sit back there on a stump and call and I'd kill a duck or two, you know. So I just started when I was real young and I practiced just like anything, 
I'd go up real early in the morning and listen to them, and then I'd try to imitate them, and that's what I did. And I spent a lot of time on that river. And I still do, I still like to get out. Well, over the years, it's been fun in Pheasants Forever, uh, taking youth on hunts to get them used to the, the hunting tradition and, and the fun of it. Uh, still, I, I take kids that come down to the, the river, the cabin, with their relatives, and, and we go out fishing. So those types of things I just really enjoy. As far as hunting, wildlife, we have lots of deer, lots of turkeys, lots of ducks and geese, rabbits and squirrels. I have done some paid guided hunting over the years. I, I guided uh, mostly goose hunters for a couple of seasons. I spent nine years down at Triple H Ranch which is now the Timber Ghost facility down there, one of the better known penned hunting areas in the country. Probably one of the most uh, interesting guys I hunted with was a fellow from New York City. He decided that he wanted to get, you know, in deep, so he bought a shotgun that cost as much as my truck and a big Weimaraner dog. And I mean, I'm talking about a big Weimaraner dog, biggest one I ever saw. We managed to knock down a pheasant, and Don wanted his dog to retrieve the bird. It had a good nose, and it found the bird. It clamped down on that bird, and Don went to try to get the bird away from the dog, and the harder that Don pulled on the bird, the harder the dog clamped down. He had this college buddy with him, and finally, Don has got the dog by the back legs, and his college buddy's got the bird. Well, needless to say, we ended up with uh, two parts bird and, and one part dog, one part Don, so. I teach in a small school in a small town, so I have however many fourth graders there are in our town. We take quite a few field trips outside, outdoor field trips, and I've always found that when we go back into the classroom, it fits into so many different parts of our curriculum and usually almost every day they bring up something that they've seen somewhere that they've done here in Louisa County that fits into what we're studying. I have students all the time saying, do you remember this is what we talked about when we were at Langwood or wherever we go, Big Sam Mountain. We've gone out to Langwood where they have the trails, they have uh, the bird watching area, they have the um, lake where they can canoe and such. I think that my students are very familiar with the outdoor areas because we have such a strong conservation office and naturalists here and they have been taking field trips since they were in preschool. We have so much land to take them out for activities. A lot of other areas don't and I was born and raised in St. Louis and we had almost none. <laughs> Often when they're sitting in the classroom they're working on a written assignment and listening to a teacher talk and when you take them outside they're able to touch things, work together, get their hands on everything. Once they have the foundation they have opportunities to go outside that's when they can actually make the connections and start seeing how it works in the real world. I'm James and we went swimming in the Iowa River near sandbars. Well, we all had life jackets on, obviously. For me, it wasn't so much swimming as floating down to the end of the swim bar and then wading back to the shore. Like, I've never gone kayaking before. I've only been canoeing a couple of times at Lingwood, but that's the first time I've been on the Iowa River and, like, canoed and kayaked. I'm Jane, and for the first time I went kayaking, finally got to cross out something on my bucket list. <laughs> I'm Bradley and I went caving for the first time. I remember going through this cave and it had like a probably half a foot of water in it when you got to the end of it and you could see there's like a big hole and you could see everybody below you. You learn a lot about like what's in the rocks and everything and how it gets there. It's like you barely know you're learning but you still are and you remember what you learn after like you think back about it. We go out to Big Sand Mount and that is private but we always have, um, they get a chance to study on the dunes. Growing up we always thought the Big Sand Mound was just a, a, an old island in the, in the Mississippi River. That's what it appeared to be. The uh, Muscatine Slough, basically the Mississippi River is coursing through Muscatine, it's headed west and then turn, makes a big, big bend and that was actually one of the early terms for Muscatine was Big Bend. Uh, and as it turned south uh, against the bluffs, uh, there was, is what now is called Muscatine Slough the channel, the current channel, is 
east of there about five miles. So you have this area that's about five miles wide east and west, and then 15, 20 miles north and south from where the old channel of the river and the new channel of the river is. So all of this area in between that's referred to as Muscatine Island is relatively low and flat. And just right in the middle of that, there's this roughly 500 acres or so that was called the Big Sand Mountain. 1928 to 29, and I lived there for 160 years anyway. <laughs> oh, I was probably 12, 13. And there's no other cave that I could find anywhere. I tell you, there was a storm. Why we head for the cave, and keep dry. Well, we didn't go in very far, but then far enough so we could set up in there. And it used to be a good place for uh, bats, yeah. Well, the quarry out of East of Morning Sun uh, has furnished a lot of the rock for crossing the river north of Wapalo. We worked, but me and my Uncle Joel had done most of the hole digging to put the dynamite in. We had to, a scraper and get the dirt off of the top of the rock. You know, when we used the dynamite for rock, one man would use a sledgehammer and then then sit down there and keep it turning it so we could get digging down in the rock. To do that maybe two days before we put dynamite in it. I slept outside at night in the summertime. Sometimes I wouldn't go in the house for a week in the summertime. Mother Nature is a pretty good teacher if you pay attention to her. Uh, one of the things that is a, probably a result of the glaciation is just to the north of us, Cone Marsh is probably a remnant of the old Lake Calvin. When I think north to south, I think of Cone Marsh and, the, and getting into the, the Wise County part of that where it's, it's the marshy part and you, you can see wildlife up there. And then as we come on down to Columbus Junction, I think of the more hilly terrain and then down towards Wapalo, the flatlands <laughs> east of Wapalo. And then as you go on down uh, towards Oakville, uh, you get a little bit more hilly and the winding uh, rivers down there, the Iowa River, and uh, really winds around and thus the Horseshoe Bend and the river name. Now today, if I played it down for you, could you tell me what it was? In a lot of cases, I can. Who taught you all that? My dad knew every bird, it seemed like. There were hawks. They would sit up on the light poles or sit on the telephone wires and swoop down and get some little mouse or rabbit or groundhog. Some that came up to Honey Creek were the uh, blue heron, and Dad was always excited when the, he could come home and tell us we'd seen a heron. And sometimes he'd take us out along to walk along the creek and, and point out the blue heron to us. We would hear the geese honk at night flying south and we go up to this north window and look out to the sky and watch the V-shaped flocks of geese fly by. I moved here in 1992. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York and here I am now in Columbus Junction, Iowa, which is home. It was three families, we moved together up here and then I went up Locust Street, which I absolutely fell in love with because it had the full grown trees on either side and you know, it's really hilly. I never noticed stars till I moved here, to be honest with you, because I guess of the smog. We've got a telescope, even though I don't know constellations or anything, but it's just interesting to me. And whenever my family comes from New York, we make a point to be outside and look. One of our mom's brothers would actually ask for a blanket and laid out in the yard and him and his wife would just lay there staring at the stars. I never lived in a big house like that. We always lived in small apartments and it was five kids with my mother, my grandmother, and my uncle. So usually it'd be seven of us, eight of us in one bedroom and my uncle would sleep on the couch. But it was okay, you know, we were happy. We didn't know any different, we were good. But then to go and live in a farmhouses, my husband and my two kids and myself. And it was like six bedrooms, two stories, doors to go out everywhere. So we'd get people over and play hide and seek. So that was fun. A couple of years ago, we went to New York and did the Empire State Building because now that I don't live there, I'm the tourist. Because it was there, why would I go? But now we go and do everything we didn't do. And you could see a couple of stars, but it's so bad up there with the smog, you actually need a mask to be up there because it's so bad. And then my asthma starts acting up again because I have really chronic asthma before moving here and I've never ever had an asthma attack since I, the day I moved here. 
it's just easy to get ahead in life and the education for the kids. It's just a better upbringing here. And the chance for them to finish school, it's, it's easier than in the city. So this land was given, deeded to them as part of the will, if you will, after the Langwith died. And that was in 1969. And the idea behind part of the wording here was that it was to be used for camping and educational use. Dad and, and A.J. Boyson and others uh, spearheaded all this, but it was all you know, donated equipment and donated time and donated uh, manpower that uh, was behind all of this. All we, I remember is driving down this gravel dirt road and hitting thick forest to where you parked and you started clearing brush just to get in to where you could even pitch a tent. So it was very much undeveloped land, completely undeveloped.